Good afternoon, and welcome to Brooklyn Law School's 13th Media and Society Lecture. The roster of prominent guests who have spoken at this event in the past have included Reed Hunt, the chairman of the FCC, Russell Lewis, the CEO of the New York Times Company and a 1973 graduate of Brooklyn Law School, renowned New York Times staffers Linda Greenhouse and Sam Roberts, and last year, Alan Grubman, a founding father of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, an entertainment lawyer and a member of the class of 1967, was our guest. Today, we're delighted to welcome, or, or more precisely, welcome back Martin D. Singer, a founding member of the law firm of Lavley and Singer in Los Angeles, and one of the most sought after entertainment and business litigators in the country. He's also a member of the Brooklyn Law School class of 1977. Shortly after beginning his career as a lawyer, M Marty founded the firm, and his practice grew quickly, which isn't surprising when you're the best at what you do. Today, the firm handles intellectual property, privacy protection, defamation, and business and entertainment-related matters for many Fortune 500 companies and also for many individual clients as well. He has personally tried more than 100 arbitrations and jury cases. For decades, Marty has been representing some of the biggest names in the entertainment world in some very high-profile matters. His client list might be mistaken for the VIP list at a hot Hollywood nightclub. It includes Bruce Willis, Halle Berry, Angelina Jolie, Sylvester Stallone, Eddie Murphy, Nicolas Cage, Johnny Depp, Scarlett Johansson, Harrison Ford, Reese Williams, Stevie Wonder, Simon Cowell, Demi Moore, and Charlie Sheen. And in fact, Marty has been the go-to litigator for so many A-listers that he might have a little tiger blood of his own. <laughs> He's regularly ranked among the top 100 attorneys by the Los Angeles and San Francisco Daily Journals. Chambers USA named him one of the best lawyers in America and the star individual attorney for media and entertainment litigation in California. He's made the Southern California Super Lawyers list every year since 2004. The New York Times has dubbed him the legal guard dog to the stars. Such is his reputation for, well, relentless doggedness in achieving favorable outcomes for his clients. I could go on and on about Marty's accomplishments and the praise he's received for his work, but if I do that, we'll run out of time before he even makes it to the podium. So please join me in welcoming our guest of honor, a truly remarkable member of the Brooklyn Law School family, Marty Singer. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming here today. It's been my, this is my 35th anniversary of coming back to the school since 1977. Uh, I want to thank President Wexler and Dean Gerber and, uh, for inviting me to attend. And I'm going to start, I'm going to talk about some of the cases that you have heard about, uh, some of the things that you uh, hear about in the news and some of the backstory information that you may not be aware of uh, in handling these type of cases. One of the things that I have done for actually over 30 years is representing talent who are on television series when a series is successful many times, even though someone is bound to a contract for generally seven years, is the, typically the term of a contract because California law provides that if, in fact, you have a contract for up to seven years, it is enforceable. If it's more than seven years, an actor, actress, athlete can get out of the contract. And typically what a contract is is they have a guaranteed contract for one year, and then there are six options. And the typical contract provides that actor gets paid a certain fee, and then they get a 5% increase. And there is significant litigation in this area or disputes. And one of the highest profile cases I handled was a case for James Gandolfini, also known as Tony Soprano. Uh, he was the star of The Sopranos, and uh, going back... I can recall in the 70s at my prior firm, there used to be a television series called All in the Family. A lot of the students may not be aware of that uh, program, but it was at the time 
by far the most popular comedy on the air. And there was an actress who was not the lead, Sally Struthers. And one day she decided, I'm not getting enough money, and I want a big raise. And because the show was so successful, uh, she basically held out and wouldn't show up for work. And the production company, the network, CBS, caved in and gave her a raise. And that was one of the first cases uh, where somebody decided, I'm going to test the system. And as the years have evolved, the studios have become very tough, as well as the networks. Uh, there used to be a show called Dukes of Hazard before the movie, and there were two actors named uh, Tom Wopat and, and uh, John um, uh, Schneider. I didn't represent them, uh, because if I did, I don't think they would have wound up where they did. And the network took a hard-line <laughs> approach, not only fired them, replaced them. Ironically, the show got canceled in one year. But those two individuals were blackballed from the industry as a result of that. Uh, there was another successful actress by the name of Valerie Harper, where she was uh, did a sequel to the show Mary Tyler Moore, and again the network took a hard line. Uh, so in fact, the networks and the studios have taken a much tougher line in these type of cases. And one of the reasons that it's a risk when you represent an actor and you want to walk off a show is today a show, when it goes into rerun syndication, is worth approximately a million dollars an episode. So that, in other words, when they sell it in syndication, so the issue is, unless you work with A&E, since I have clients in A&E, they don't make the million dollars an episode, but no, that's just for the A&E table. <laughs> but uh, no, seriously, and there's a risk that if you walk off a show, you could go bankrupt. They literally can file a lawsuit against you, and, I, and, and you could wipe out your net assets, not to mention the costs of having to possibly cancel the show. So the damages are significant. And I came up with a unique approach, in my opinion, that had never occurred previously with uh, litigation over someone who was trying to get a better deal, and that was Jim Gandolfini. Uh, Mr. Gandolfini's contract was a little bit more unique than a typical show on the um, networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox, in that an option had to be picked up, and we had done our analysis with the representatives and came to the conclusion that they had not properly picked up the option. But we were still taking a risk, because if we walked off the show, uh, Gandolfi uh, so The Sopranos was perhaps the number one show on HBO, was driving millions of viewers to the network. And so I came up with the idea of why walk off the show, potentially get sued for millions of dollars, why don't we file a lawsuit but continue working? And we filed a lawsuit for declaratory relief, which basically stated that we take the position that this contract is terminated, but we're going to continue to work until the court makes a decision. Now, in California, declaratory relief actions get resolved in approximately six months. Most cases take years to get resolved, but you can get these cases fast-tracked, especially when you have a judge, and judges are not used to having big stars. They treat the cases differently, and you find. They want to try the case. They don't want to grant summary judgments for the most part. So we filed a lawsuit for declaratory relief, and I told the client also they'll be paying you while we're in litigation. You won't be short of a, of a paycheck, and that was the strategy. And it was news because no one had ever done this before where you threaten to walk off a show, but rather than just walk off the show, let the court decide. Well, HBO was very clever, though. They knew they most probably were going to lose the case. And at that time, had they lost the case, Mr. Gandolfini could have made, he was making approximately a million dollars an episode, and they only do 13 episodes. Most network television, you do 22 to 24 episodes, where someone on a big star on network television would make 40 million a year. He could have hit the network for at least 10 million an episode, if he wanted to, 5 million an episode. It would have been groundbreaking because of the success of the show, and they still hadn't done that series with the going black yet, the end of the show. <laughs> they had no ending in sight. We didn't know what happened to Paulie. We didn't know what happened to any of the characters. It would have just been hanging there. It might have been a better ending, by the way, than what it turned out. 
So HBO knew Gandolfini better than, than we did. What did they do? They sh he was willing to work and let the courts decide. HBO decided two weeks before scheduled production was shutting down. They shut down production. Now we've got 50 to 75 people out of work, the cast and the crew. And I don't know if people know, some of the members in the cast were really ex-Mafia members. And I remember getting a couple of threats. <laughs> One of the reasons I changed my email address. But Jim was really concerned about the fact that all these people were out of work, especially the cast, the crew. That's what he was concerned about. People will contact Jim, what have you done? You make enough money. And he decided to start paying the crew. He literally paid every crew member, not the cast. He felt that they can take care of themselves, but the crew, the people behind the scenes. And ultimately he decided, you know what? I can't have this show off the air, these people out of work. And we settled. He made a very fair settlement. Uh, and it was a, a good resolution for him, but he could have gotten a much better resolution had we gone all the way, but I have to give the network credit where it's one of the first times ever where they basically canceled the show. And the difference is, had the show been on traditional network television, they may not have been able to do it because typically a series starts in September through May. When you're on cable, they really can change any time the show's on the air. Now, interesting... Uh, when we filed the Charlie Sheen suit, people are not aware of it. One of the things that Charlie Sheen was really upset over was the fact also that a decision was made to shut down production for a period of four weeks, uh, and I'm going to get into that in a minute, and the, we filed a lawsuit so that all the crew members would get paid. It's under the private attorney general statute, and we claim that, the, that Warner Brothers was obligated to pay the members of the cast. In fact, we did that for two reasons, for three reasons. One, he really felt that the crew should get paid. Two, there was a little good publicity for him, and he needed as good publicity as he had. And three, and this might have been one of the bigger reasons, is one of the biggest disputes that took place in the Sheen case was whether or not the case should go to arbitration or before a jury trial. And PAGA claims, which is private attorney general claims, go before the uh, go before a jury. Now, talking about Charlie Sheen, I'm gonna let's see if this works. Big technology, a dictating unit. <laughs> and, and, and you know, tell folks the truth about it. But the point is, uh, is that uh, it seems like there's some people. Uh, in, in your life that are trying to demonize you, they're doing these vanity cards, talking about how they're going to outlive you. It, it seems pretty darn aggressive. Yeah, I didn't care about that vanity card. In fact, I went straight on with that one and just dispelled that. That was actually, a, you know, one of the few compliments that clown has paid me in freaking almost a decade. Um, but I'm excited to get back to work um, and not to completely discount what you just talked about. It's just if I, if I, if I bring up these these these, these turds, these little sermonculies. Losers. There's, there's no reason to, 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 to then, you know, bring them back into the fold because I have real fame. They have, they have nothing. They have zero. They have, they have that night. I will, I will forget about them as, uh, as the last image of them exits my beautiful home. And, um, and they will get out there and they will sell me and then they will lose. And they will lose the rest of their lives as they think about me and my life the rest of their lives. So it's, it's, there's no. It's, again, bring me a challenge, somebody. Bring me a freaking challenge because, you know, it just ain't there. Winning. But you're ready to go to, back to work right now. Well, yeah, but, but balance ain't a tell you, man. I'm, and, you know, I'm tired of being told, like, oh, you can't talk about that, you can't talk about that. Bull S-H-I-T. Uh, let me just say this. It's nothing... Uh, uh, this side of deplorable that a certain Haim Levine, yeah, that's Chuck's real name, uh, mistook this rock star for his own selfish exit strategy, bro. Check it, Alex. I embarrassed him in front of his children in the world by healing at a pace that, that his unevolved mind cannot process. Okay, last I check, Haim, uh, I've spent, I think, 
most of the last decade, I don't know, effortlessly and magically converting your, your tin cans into pure gold. And the gratitude I get in this, get is, is this charlatan chose not to do his job, which is to write. Clearly someone who believes he is above the law. Well, you've been warned, dude. Bring it. All right, so... None of his representatives, including me, knew what was happening, but that resulted in Charlie Sheen getting suspended from the show. He got suspended without pay, and he didn't take it too kindly, wasn't listening to representatives after that occurred, and then he decided, and by the way, the the whole dispute was with uh, Chuck Lorre, who we refer to as Heim Levine, uh, and it started in part because Chuck Lorre, I don't know if you know, in Two and a Half Men and a couple of shows, they call him vanity cards. He made a very insulting card about Charlie Sheen, how he was going to outlive him. He was ten- they had a horrible relationship for the eight years, even though it's true. When Chuck Lorre started Two and a Half Men, he was literally broke. And now, at that time, he was perhaps the most powerful producer on TV, worth hundreds of millions of dollars as a result of that show. And so, um, after that occurred... Uh, and the l- lawyers were jockeying myself with the attorneys for CBS and Warner Brothers about they had no right to suspend him. Uh, Charlie decided to uh, make some more statements in the media where he said uh, he's, he's self-healed his addictions by saying that he, quote, blinked and cured his brain. I've closed my eyes, and in a nanosecond I cured myself from their ridiculous model of disease. When they are not ready for a guys like you and I that are high priests, Vatican assassins, warlocks, you have to hate everyone who's not your family because they're there to destroy your family. My motto, man, is that you either love or hate, and you must do so violently. Uh, He referred to Thomas Jefferson as a pussy. (laughs) This was the biggest mistake, though. I have to say, because this was the biggest problem. He called the executives, the people who make the decision to pay him money, fools and trolls, and he did not have time for these clowns. Um, And the real person who he was really upset was Chuck Lorre, and he called him a stupid, stupid little man and a pussy punk piece of shit turd (laughs) and clown. He violently hates him. He owns Mr. Lorre. And he challenged him to fight him in the octagon. <laughs> and he said, Lori is a contaminated little maggot, a retarded zombie, and I only wish him nothing but pain. He says, but I have tiger blood and Adonis <laughs> DNA. And I'm not bipolar, I'm by winning. And I'm a total bitch and rock star from Mars. So that decided that, you know what, now you've gone after the network executive. Just going after Char- uh, Chuck Lorre, you're fired off the show. Now, what's the backstory? Why did Charlie Sheen sue, and why did he wind up with an unbelievable settlement, which I'll be discussing shortly? He had been on the show for eight years. Uh, he had started out salary, he had uh, successfully replaced Michael J. Fox on his television series, and he was making 160000 an episode, which was a very good salary at the time. Sheen, although he's had addiction problems, been in rehab and been in the news over these years, he's been totally professional. Showed up on the set, did whatever he was asked to do. Um, and Warner Brothers, the production company, recognized. They constantly gave him raises. Now, in 2010, actually late 2009, December, Christmas 2009, which was the date that he got arrested uh, for putting a knife to his wife's throat, and he was arrested for multiple felonies and drug offenses in Aspen, Colorado. This was Christmas Day. Following that arrest in 2010, Sheen's contract had expired. He didn't have to come back to the show. And notwithstanding the fact that he was facing multiple felonies, being accused of being more than abusive to a woman, threatening to kill her with a knife, and making other statements to women that were not something that was appealing to advertisers, 
the network was begging him to come back on the show. And he said, I'm not. And finally, they were willing to negotiate a deal with him to make him the highest paid TV star ever. While he was facing felony charges, but he didn't call his boss a clown. That's a mistake. And, you know, it's an interesting side note. I'll rem- I never I forget December 25, 2009. I don't observe Christmas, but Christmas Day at about 8 a.m. I got a phone call. Charlie Sheen got arrested for uh, allegedly threatening his wife with a knife. And that's where my best result came in in terms of doing work for Charlie Sheen because here he is on Aspen on Christmas Day, and he said, I don't want to go to jail. And I was able that day to find him a bail bondsman on Christmas Day in Colorado, a lawyer, and the biggest problem was to try through contacts of who I had clients in Colorado to find a judge such that he was able to get out of bail that day, and so he never spent one night in jail as a result of that. But in the interim, he's facing felony charges, he's in rehab, and the network is begging for him to come back to work on the show, and in fact, they renegotiated a deal where basically they paid him ultimately approximately $2 million an episode with additional back-end compensation. And I dealt with Warner and said, we don't even care if he's a convicted felon. Just make sure he doesn't miss too much of our time, and then we'll delay the season. But we'll pay him the money we really want him. Now, in that backdrop, you hear, and he went into rehab. So what happened? What was the reason? Now, people who followed the case may have known about it. So what happened? The end of 2010, beginning of 2011, unfortunately had another problem with drugs, and he finally agreed in late January to go into rehab. But as the deal was the year before, that he wanted to make it clear, and when Mongols rep- that if I now start passing my drug tests and my alcohol tests, I want to make sure that I'll be coming back. We're going to start production. He said, absolutely no problem. And I have to give Charlie credit. Within two weeks, he was dedicated himself. He passed all his drug tests, alcohol tests, blood tests, you name it, every test. In fact, some tabloids had him take tests. He passed the test, said, I'm ready to come back. Chuck Lorre, however, was not happy. Chuck Lorre said, who was the executive producer, as I call him, the 900-pound gorilla, said, well, you know what? We're not ready for him. So tell him to come back in two weeks. That is when Charlie first made those rants about Chuck Lorre. And then three days later he said, and by the way, I made a decision. I'm sick and tired of working with him. It's too tough. We're going to shut down the season six weeks early, and we're not going to do four episodes. He's not going to work on four episodes. I don't think anyone in this room, if they were working at a law firm or any other job, told their boss, you know what, during prime time or whatever the key time of the season, I've decided not to work for the next four weeks. I'm going to stop working four weeks early. In fact, I've been doing this for 35 years. I've never heard an actor, a writer, a director, or a producer tell their bosses, you know what, I'm not working for four more weeks. I've decided I've worked too hard on this show. Unfortunately, because Chuck Lorre was the 900-pound gorilla in that he had three of the biggest shows on CBS, Mike and Molly, uh, and another show uh, um, that he had, uh, oh, The Big Bang Theory, one of my favorite non-shows, no. But uh, a lot of people in middle America watch The Big Bang Theory. In fact, raise your hand if you've ever seen one episode of Big Bang Theory. <laughs> Look at that, very popular show in this part of the room. I'm sure it's very good. I've made it a practice. When I sue someone, I don't watch their show. So. <laughs> now, so Warner Brothers fired him. We took the position, you had no right to unilaterally cancel the show four weeks early. It's unheard of. And our dispute was really with Lori. He's the guy that caused the problems. He's the guy with Charlie were fighting like cats and dogs. So we sued Lori, we sued Warner Brothers, and we made a strategic decision, let's not sue the network. And we did. And it was a good idea because there are so many buyers, networks, and the decision was, don't sue CBS, and it, w- and it was good. Because, in fact, before the last season, of uh, this past season, CBS was lobbying for Charlie to come back before they hired uh, Ashton Kutcher, another one of my clients, on the show. 
And that was one of the reasons we thought because CBS was back channeling, try to work this out, and we decided not to sue them. Now, everybody heard these statements. Everybody thought Charlie may have been crazy. Why did we want to go before a jury rather than a private arbitrator? Because my, success, my experience is, and people who try cases know, and in my opinion, you get a much better result with a jury. Plus, if you lose, you have a right to appeal if there's a mistake. With an arbitration, if you lose, that's it. You basically, unless you can show an arbitrator committed fraud. So we were fighting. In fact, that was the big part of the case. Should we go to arbitration? Should we go to court? That's one of the reasons we sued Chuck Lorre. We do this private attorney general claim. We've claimed also that there was uh, a FIHA violation, American Disabilities violation. Warner, uh, Warner Brothers claimed that he was disabled, that he was, uh, uh, you know, he, he had substance abuse problems. Well, if they claimed he was disabled, they had no right to fire him while he's, quote, disabled. But there was a big thing that Warner Brothers screwed up on. The contract had a notice to cure provision. They were so upset that they never gave him a right to cure. So I felt very confident at the end of the day, which means notice to cure means if you don't do X in 10 days, we're going to have you in breach. If they had sent the letter, you better stop talking, and then in 10 days, otherwise you're going to get fired, I guarantee you he would have stopped talking. We would have put him in Brazil or Portugal <laughs> where they didn't have microphones. But he felt I was accused of a felony. I almost supposedly killed my wife. I've been a drug. I did all these things. They always wanted me back. But now, they did. Now, at the end of the day, we wound up in arbitration. The judge wimped out. Uh, he didn't want the publicity and the high profileness of this case. But the case ultimately settled. And why the case settled is typically what happens is we noticed depositions where people want to examine someone. I had the president of Warner Brothers scheduled for four consecutive days. I had Chuck Lorre scheduled for three days. Uh, we had all these depositions scheduled, and lo and behold, everyone said, let's, let's have a peace offering. And I don't know how many people are here today. It was about 100 or so. So let me just say this in terms of the settlement. Everyone walked out of here with a million dollars. That would be about half, ultimately, of what Charlie Sheen's settlement will be in that case. So they, every, he did very well. He's now moving on to his next show. So let me talk about other things that... You know, one of the biggest claims people we deal with is defamation cases and cases involving the paparazzi. We call them paparazzi in California. New York, they call them photographers, I guess. <laughs> paparazzi. We have a couple in the back taking pictures. They're photographers, not paparazzi. You don't work for the National Enquirer, is that correct? Not today. Oh, not today. <laughs> Us Magazine, they pay much better. Um, so... I'm going to be walking in the street, holding this bottle, and I'm walking, and the paparazzi sees me, except it's not Marty Singh, because who cares if Marty Singh is drinking, but it happened to be Britney Spears in the height of her career. And the paparazzi said she's drinking alcohol. And the headline is... Brittany hits the bottle. Boozer Brittany. And, and so I understand, if a paparazzi takes a photo of her taking her bottle that she was drinking, now let me just show you the difference. I left half of this on the way here. Some <laughs> Johnny Walker Black Label, if I'm walking like this, yes, I am hitting the bottle. Or, for those people who think it's too strong, J and B, I have some J and B. But what was Britney Spears drinking? Neither. It was ginseng. Now, interestingly, because we deal with the media, the Daily News called and said, was she drinking alcohol? And we said, no. It was ginseng. And the news and the post always like to say how the other one got it wrong, and the Daily News got it right right away and said, no, it was ginseng. The paparazzi made a lot of money. Britney Spears was, was obviously very embarrassed by the story. And it's accusing someone of a crime. You know, drinking alcohol in public, unless you're in London or in Europe, is okay. You know, it's a crime here in the U.S. You're not supposed to be, you're supposed to at least have, you know, that's why you sometimes see people with brown bags. Or you're not supposed to be drinking in public. So it's a crime. 
Well, we made a very fair settlement for her with the New York Post, and uh, that's one of the type of cases you read about. Now, anybody remember the term, Eddie Murphy is a good Samaritan? That's a term I came up with at 6 o'clock in the morning when I got a phone call. Uh, sometimes I have to act as a publicist, where Eddie Murphy was picked up, to know, Eddie Murphy picked up a transvestite in Hollywood. And uh, everybody was panicking. Now, the thing is, nobody realized Eddie Murphy never got arrested. Um, and, but still pretty embarrassing to get caught with a transvestite on Hollywood Boulevard at 4 a.m. in the morning. Uh, now, nothing happened to Eddie. He didn't get arrested. Um, and we still don't know how this occurred, is that the police stopped him about 13 blocks later, and there was a film crew from Hard Copy showing the cops, interviewing him and the transvestite. So we, anyway, I came up with that statement. He was a good Samaritan. Didn't go that well. Uh, <laughs> As opposed to, what? A, listen, so what if he likes transvestites? No big deal. Um, and, but what happened next? Every show, Tonight Show, uh, David Letterman, Saturday Night Live, every tabloid, every newspaper, we're talking about how Eddie Murphy was with transvestites. And then, to top things off, the tabloids, and particularly the Inquirer, the Globe, the Star, had people quoted saying, I had sex with Eddie. One day I had sex. He was just staring at my feet, but he got aroused. So I'm sure that was sexual in nature. But So they ran these stories, and, and, and we were really concerned, all his representatives, that this, could be, this was really bad at the time. This was like the biggest news. And then we decided we need to shut it down, and I filed four lawsuits against all the tabloids who were running these stories about having sex with these transvestites. And what happens? All of a sudden, no one's talking about it. People were afraid of getting sued. Anybody wanted to write a story, I threatened them with, like, letters. People say the famous Marty Singer letter. But anyway, they were getting threatened. And people were afraid to write. And the story now is the back burner. Now it was Frank Gifford fooling around with a stewardess uh, with Kathy Lee. said it never happened, and they showed the video of it. But we weren't involved in that. But anyway, it was off the news, and it stopped the bad stories. And there was an interesting part to this case. The National Enquirer and the other tabloids claimed, well, these people pass lie detector tests. And sometimes you read they pass lie detector tests. It's very easy to pass a lie detector test. You just take some Ambien or some Prozac. You'll pass a lie detector test. So anyone of you get arrested and you need to pass a lie detector test, <laughs> that's the key. Or your clients are. That's right, I'm being with lawyers. Lawyers don't commit these kind of crimes. Just, just, you know, seriously, I know this for a fact. I've dealt with lie detector tests. You take someone to Prozac, they, dealt, they don't have the, the spike. So they said, these people pass lie detector tests. So I had to hire investigators, not the typical private investigators, to try to find the transvestites in Hollywood and certain areas in, in Los Angeles, San Francisco. And sure enough, we found like eight of them that were part of these stories. We treated everybody to lunch. Gave them $50 for coming. We took videos. The same people who were quoted who said, yes, I had sex. Said, oh, no, that never happened. Never happened. What was the purpose? Was to show that these people are unreliable. You give them a little money and not a lot, $50 and a sandwich, they'll change their story. And they were just so happy to be in the news. And by using that, I was able to convince all the tabloids, you had no reliability in these witnesses. Under the law in the United States, the worst law, in my opinion, is to prevail on a defamation claim because it's not enough if the story's false. You must prove that the publication knew or should have known that the story was false. Then you are able, and it's, it's called actual malice, and it's a very difficult standard. But we claim these people, you didn't know these people from a hole in the wall. And we ultimately made great settlements. And you don't read about stories anymore about Eddie Murphy being with these alleged transvestites or transvestites. So that was one of the things that we accomplished in terms of one of my other high profile. This might not have been as high profile a case, but a, 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 a case that something similarly occurs. How many times you've read a story where it says someone was caught canoodling or kissing someone? You think, oh, my God, how could that person do that? And this goes back a little wall, a little way. Vince Vaughn, when he was dating Jennifer Aniston, and um, 
They showed a picture at a good angle of him kissing this blonde. And, and he's kissing this blonde, and this story wound up all over. Vince Vaughn cheating on Jennifer Aniston. Vince Vaughn caught cheating. It was the woman who organized the event. It would be if I kissed Joan Wetz on her cheek and said, Marty Singer's cheating on his wife. He was kissing... He was kissing the organizer of the event just on the cheek. Of fr- but it didn't matter because the paparazzi could make a lot of money. Saying, oh, we saw them you know, making out when, in fact, it was just a, a little kiss on the cheek. But, of course, on the angle with a camera, you can make it look like anything. So that was one of the cases we handled where – and we handled very many cases. Like I just didn't have the photos of the other ones, but uh, uh, which resulted in very favorable settlements both in the U.K. and in the uh, – uh, US. Another case uh, you may have read about, this goes back also a little while, one of my clients, the uh, ex-governor of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger, had heart surgery. And uh, he replaced the valve, and he's an amazing physical specimen, and the way heart surgery is right now, it's amazing how people can recuperate. Within two months, he was already in Hawaii uh, swimming in the ocean. He was playing football with the Kennedy family in Hyannisport. Yet, Cover story of a tabloid, Arnold Schwarzenegger dying. And they have a picture of him walking like Artie Johnson from uh, like this. Because it was right after the surgery. They said, this is Arnold now. And this was really a significant impact for him because he still wanted to be an action star, didn't decide yet to go into politics. And... um, the reason we got such a great settlement, because everybody's dying. Everyone in this room may, quote, be dying one day. But they lied, and they said, this is how he is now. And so we got one of the largest settlements ever uh, at the time because we found out that they even found a doctor to lie. In fact, sometimes you read these stories, these doctors give opinions. One of the cases I had, which was a little bit sad, is I represent Celine Dion. This was not a defamation case, but... I get a hysterical call from the husband, Rene Angelil. You must sue. It says Celine Dion pregnant with twins. I said, well, that's great news. <laughs> no, she's not pregnant. I don't have my French accent today. No, she's not pregnant. <laughs> I said, this has been horrible. Her relatives and friends were calling. She was getting flowers. She had 50 floral arrangements congratulating her. Some doctor claimed that she was pregnant with twins. And it was such a tough thing. And she said, I don't care what it costs. Spend millions. I want to own those magazines, what they've done for her. And the biggest fight we had was whether we keep the case in California or in Florida. And it was a very interesting case because Celine Dion lived in Florida and in Montreal. The inquirer was in Florida, but her lawyer was in California. So we were able to convince a court that the case should stay in California because we felt claimed that all her representatives are in California. This is where she generates most of her income from deals that are made, and, and that was one of the biggest aspects of the case. Now, ironically, that would case, she did not want to settle. We had settlement offers from day one. However, a year later, She really did get pregnant, but not with twins. And then the client decided, do I really need litigation anymore when you make $40 million at Caesars Palace, take care of my son? And so the case settled in a, you know, reasonable amount of money, but at least she just didn't want to pursue it. The vigor did not agree. Now, I know it's almost, uh, but I just wanted to, sometimes you represent people who are not celebrities and not wannabes, like a lot of people. Like Mike, the situation, no, he is a celebrity. (laughs) <laughs> but um, we didn't have reality TV back then where everybody was a celebrity. So cover photo, Jane Fonda tragedy. Devastating secret she's hiding. And you look at the picture and say, my God, she had, pl- I don't know if you can all see, she's got like blackened eyes with sunglasses, and there's a picture of Jane Fonda. And... You know, then they show pictures, and it, this woman said, wow, what's so big deal? Jane Fonda had plastic surgery, so. But this woman was not Jane Fonda. <laughs> and she happened to be in an elevator in a high-rise apartment in, in, in L.A., and someone 
had the inquirer, looked at her, wearing her sunglasses. So are you Jane Fonda? No, she wasn't. She was a private citizen. And this happens. People make mistakes. They, it's not before or after photos, but in fact, this woman felt humiliated, quite frankly. The reason she felt humiliated, I don't know why that's such humiliation. She had plastic surgery. She wanted to keep it a secret. But to her, it was a humiliation because she was on a cover. People recognized it. Now everybody knows I had plastic surgery. Well, I'm saying if you have plastic surgery, what's the big deal? But it was something very troubling to her, and they made a mistake. And so, you know, ultimately we got a very fair settlement without having to file um, a lawsuit. Uh, you know, there are many type of cases we had. And one of the cases I do remember I have, it was an interesting case I had many years ago in Demi Moore and Bruce Willis. I was re represented both of them. I still represent the two of them after their divorce. And then after Demi got separated from Ashton, was with Ashton, I still represent Demi and Ashton, although that's a little more tense than it was with Demi and Bruce. But a year before they announced they're getting separated, uh, or they were getting divorced. Bruce Willis and Demi Moore, marital woes. I represent two clients. One of the clients calls me and says, you must sue. It's totally false. The other client says, do we really have to sue? <laughs> I said, well, you know, your wife's very upset over this story. And lo and behold, we sued, claiming there was no marital woes, and they made up a story that they had seen a divorce lawyer. They had not seen any divorce lawyers. And the case is going, and there was some big exposure there because, at least at the time, you know, it made it seem like both of them had been involved in indiscretions. And then I got a frantic phone call. Uh, I'm filing for a divorce in a week from now. This is a year later. I said, what? You think you can settle that case? So I said, you give me a week, right? So can you put it off for another week? Well, we'll see. Anyway, they did put it off for another week. But I settled, and then afterwards we resolved it, and then like a week or two later they announced their final divorce. I said, listen, it didn't matter. At the time you wrote the story, they weren't going through a divorce. But, you know, these are interesting things that happen while you're representing celebrities uh, among the different types. Of, I mean, I can go on and on. I don't know if you want me to have some questions or if you can continue with as many other things you want. Just... But maybe we should have some questions now, if it, anyone has any questions here. That many, huh? Yes? Well, let me make it clear. I'm not a transactional lawyer. Um, in fact, I've had many clients who have approached me to be their transactional lawyer. That's the lawyer who negotiates their deals. I will not do that. Uh, and the reason being is that's where the bread and butter is for my business, is that the people who are the transactional lawyers usually refer their clients to me, and they don't have litigation attorneys. And so I never get involved. I get involved in reviewing the agreements to make sure they're protected, but I will not negotiate their deals. So, no, I just happened, yeah, I represented him, but I did not have anything to do with the representation of him on the new agreement. No, because at the t assuming I would have rep and by the way, in the entertainment industry that happens all the time, where you represent or that you represent someone and they replace them with one of your other clients, uh, and they don't have a signed conflict of interest. So that is not a technical conflict, especially in the situation. Hypothetically, if I represented them, they had already made the decision by June when they have to make a decision that they were not bringing Sheen back, so it was a question of who they were going to have to replace him. So, no, but I don't get involved in those type of deals. I leave that for the lawyers who like to take two-hour lunches. So, <laughs> well, I brown bag it or bring something upstairs to my, my office. I love reading your letters. They're fascinating. Um, most of them have on the end of the letters that you have posted to the environment of the opera. And then after reading, it's posted on the various websites. Well, it used to be we were much more successful with that tagline. In fact, I've taken it out on most of my letters now. My, some of my associates keep it in or they'll draft it and, you know, and revise and I'll revise. But I've kept it because it is true. 
that it would not be a copyright violation. It would be uh, fair use in terms of if it's an ongoing dispute. Now, if it's an old matter, you could argue that it, they shouldn't publish it. But many times they don't publish the entire letter. But what's going on now on the, with the Internet especially, they're much more blatant about violating rights, whether it's taking photos or doing anything. But uh, for the most part, you're correct. They do get posted. But no, we recognize that the letters may be published. And that's why, at, at this time, and so that's why when I write a letter, I write such bad things about the other side, I want them to publish it so everyone will know what the facts are. And that's the better way to avoid your letters getting published. So that's been my new strategy, is rather than just send a pure legal letter, now I say how horrible they are. I said, please publish my letter, and I write it at the end. But no, uh, but you're correct. But no, I, we don't do that. I recognize that we're not going to sue over it. And uh, the goal is to prevent things from occurring. I mean, one of the things that what I do a lot, in fact, today's Monday, like Friday and this weekend, what I do a lot of work is preventing stories from getting out. In fact, once the story's out, it's very difficult to do anything about it before the law. So that yesterday I had two stories, one with TMZ, and uh, which still hasn't come out, and another one with the uh, New York Post that still hasn't come out. We don't know if it will come out, but I'm dealing with them. We try to, and you literally you're given a couple of hours to try to prevent those stories from coming out. But my uh, position on letters now is I just put as much bad stuff as I can. Like I've got a claim against PETA right now, where I call them a terrorist organization. I hope all of you are big supporters. I just read that. <laughs> It's a great animal rights organization. They raised eight and a half million dollars last year. Seven and a half million went to salaries for their employees, and one million went to uh, support organizations. And uh, and they are just they don't care because they really are so powerful in terms. They don't care what they say about things. But uh, that may be the next thing you may be reading about what we'll be writing about in terms of what Peter did with the television series Luck that was canceled. Uh, but. You know, we, that letter started out, I'd like Peter to say, you are a terrorist organization, you know, that, that, that's going to go out. Let them publish that letter um, if they want to, because that's what I believe they are, if anyone's had dealings with them. And you could be supporters of Peter's fine. We're, I'm a huge, don't take this, I'm not a huge animal rights uh, supporter. I have three dogs, two of them are rescues. My daughter, older daughter who couldn't make it today, she's one of the biggest supporters of, and we're a huge supporter of them. But unfortunately, some people take advantage of their power, and so, but, and that's a perfect example where when I wrote that letter or drafted it, it hasn't gone out, I wanted to write it such, well, let Peter publish it. Now, what they'll do is they won't publish that paragraph, possibly, but then I'll get TMZ to publish the whole unedited letter if I need them to do so. Yes? Good question. I'm not a lawyer, that's why. She did go to jail. She did. She did spend time in jail but not hard time at Rikers or Sing Sing. No, but she did go to women's jail. Uh, she had a very tough judge, and she did go to jail. Not a lot, but it's my recollection, she did go to jail. I think it was that designer dress, though, the first time. But she made a mistake. It was a woman judge rather than a male judge. <laughs> but she did go to jail, yes. Say that again? Well, no, let me tell you what. The, the problem is if they, they, they do sell enough to cover potential litigation costs, and there are various organizations, like I don't know if people are familiar with Gawker.com. Gawker.com, and I've had gone to fights with them, although they have a philosophy that if you sue us and we write something, I mean, if you write something, we'll never take it down. We don't care if we're wrong 100%. You have to sue them. And they make their multi-billion dollar, multi-million, not billion, but they're owned by one of the wealthiest men from England. Uh, and we've sued them several times. We've gotten good success. But we do know, and I tell my clients, they're not going to take it down. So I don't know if I'm going to waste my time with a letter. So if you want to go after them, we really need to sue them. But, yes, some of them will take a very aggressive position. Yes, they do make a lot of money. It substantially dwarfs the potential litigation costs. And a lot of these organizations also have significant in-house lawyers. So those law students that are looking for jobs, uh, seriously, that these um, – uh, publications do have a lot of in-house lawyers. Yes, Professor. We have, and the law is changing. They call it the Marty Singer law. No, but seriously, I must have had, I get contact. No, we, we have, and the law is constantly evolving. 
the best place to sue is in the U.K. because many times they pick up the stories, the same stories that are published in the U.S. usually get published in the United Kingdom or Australia. We sue both. And uh, did you agree with that back in America? Uh, well, you know, they changed the law since then. But you, the, what happens in England is that 99% of all cases settle because in England, which is the common law principles, uh, that there's not a lot of damages but your legal fees are unbelievable costs, and if you lose, you have to pay the other person's legal fees. So that uh, we have found that in England we've gotten great results, but they're constantly changing laws. Like a few years ago, they provide that you get a judgment in the UK, it would not be enforceable in the US because of the different rules on defamation. But to the extent, if only if you go after websites, if you go after a major publication, you'll still prevail in the U.S. because the standard in, in the U.K. and for the rest of the world, for the most part, is all you need to show is the story's false and hurts your reputation, uh, which sometimes is difficult to prove because like, I've had clients that, you know, have cheated, and they said, they've accused me of cheating with Cindy Crawford. I said, what's wrong with that? <laughs> have you seen her up front? <laughs> she looks pretty good on TV. He says, no, I wouldn't do it with a paper bag. He says, so... Bottom line is, <laughs> I said, but have you ever cheated on anyone else? Well, what's the point? What's the difference? I said, then you can't sue. It didn't hurt your reputation. But so you have to show it hurts your reputation. Uh, and besides, the story's false. But it's very difficult. And plus, they have a new, I don't know if people are familiar, a lot of practicing lawyers may be familiar. At least in California, they have it. And New York has what's called the anti slap statute, S L A P P, strategic lawsuits against public policy. It started with the O.J. case with Cato Kalin, innocent Cato Kalin, who became a media star. Too bad they didn't have reality TV then. He'd be huge by now. Uh, but anyway, they claimed that he was part of the murder, that he was somehow involved in covering it up. It was a false story, but the Globe was able to prevail against him uh, under the anti-slap statute, which typically was, was enacted to protect consumers and, and to protect people where, like, big oil companies would come to a neighborhood and they would they would build some refinery and it would have a terrible effect on the environment and these individuals would get sued for defamation because they'd say look this is causing terrible things for the environment and all of a sudden now it's been exp expanded so now almost every lawsuit is subject anything involving advertising a defamation gets subject to an anti-slap uh, which which is a terrible situation you don't have to show summary judgment you just show that you're likely to prevail, and then you have to pay the other person's legal fees. So it's a very bad uh, law that ex – well, not a bad law, but the law has been expanded significantly beyond what it was intended to cover. Yes. Hi. Um, so you have an amazing client list. Um, and what I wonder is you said that the only reason um, – the only reason why you should pursue any kind of legal action against a magazine or publication is that it's going to damage your reputation. But there are stories that come out – Every single week, for example, about like Angelina and Brad uh, talking about two of my clients. Go yeah. ahead. Exactly, um, talking about things like oh, Jennifer Aniston's been contacting Brad behind Angela's back, and all of these kind of crazy stories that I, as a reporter, wonder uh, half the time where they're coming from. How do you determine what's actually worthwhile to pursue? You know, it's very interesting because in, in those two clients, some clients go back to like Roseanne, I represented in her heyday which she felt there's no such thing as bad publicity and was upset the one day they wouldn't write about him. Um, and so, and of those two clients, I won't mention which one, one of the two doesn't mind the bad publicity unless it involves children. And so no matter what they say, they may not want to pursue it. Another one of them is much more vigorous in, in protecting their rights. And so, the, you know, it is a delicate line. Now, many times we write letters and, but you find that if you ignore it, they'll write more and more and more. So you have to take the approach of, of going after it. And many times you're not aware of it that one of these stories you read about, there might have been a behind-the-scenes settlement with a demand letter sent, and you could find fact. But the key, what we do, is try to prevent the stories from coming out because, as you say, once they come out, what do you do? And the fact is that I think 75 80 percent of people, whatever they read, they believe is true, whether it's true or not. Uh, but uh, it depends on the on the individual how vigilant they want to be. I've had clients they get upset every week. I say, you know what? Don't even go on the newsstand. Don't read this stuff. 
and it becomes a problem when their children read it and that's when they become even more upset but you're right we get away with murder here in the u s because of the laws that exist with defamation that you can't really stop false stories but i have found i've had a pretty good success rate in stopping stories uh... that some publications are much more responsible and if you can prove to them the story's false they won't run it uh... in fact ironically like the inquirer I have a much better success rate with them than the New York Times and the L.A. Times. They, when they've got reporters working for weeks on a story, they just want to figure out a way to get it out there, whether it's true or false. Uh, so, but anyway, they do have different approaches in how to deal with these type of stories. One more. One more. Hi. Said with authority by um, the dean. I, thought, I think this has been a fantastic afternoon and both educational and amusing for all of us. Uh, I have a two-part question. Did you There's watch the? Uh, you got to pick A or B. Did you watch Mad Men last night? And will you comment on the Matthew Weiner or Weiner litigation against AMC? Oh, I didn't know he sued AMC. Good, Mr. Weiner sued uh, AMC. Well, I didn't watch uh, Mad Men. Well, is there some significance? Although my wife wanted to watch it. Well, just that it's like a pretty big show right now. What's that? No, I know it's a big show, but but what did they show about? Well, there there Weiner he was is in, ready he, to sue. He was he was in litigation with AMC. Oh, not A and E. <laughs> not A and E. <clears throat> oh, he was in okay. litigation. I have no idea about that case. So oh, okay. I don't know anything about it. I wish I did, but well, my I'll, I'll is talk to you about it later. He should lose for lying to the media. He should have told the truth from day one. If I was his lawyer, never would have happened. I've represented presidential candidates. You can't lie. In my opinion, Matthew Weiner has no credibility in any suit. He was a liar with a capital L. And he'll have, because he lied about what happened, Jim, unless it's a different wiener we're talking about. I, I'm talking about the writer of, of Mad Men. Oh, the writer. I think we're talking about the congressman wiener. Oh, n- no. You don't watch Mad Men. It's okay. Bad, bad last question. Sorry, None Michael, of take shows over. I don't watch. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Who is Matthew Weiner, I want to know. That's the bigger question. Okay, good to know. You want a bottle of ginseng also? Yeah, I'll take this out. Those of you who have 2 o'clock class, go. Say that uh, they didn't give you a 10-minute grace period. <laughs>